Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the DLC's Responsible Light at Night webinar series. Today's topic will address the impacts of light at night on wildlife and ecosystems. My name is Doreen Minichia, and I'm the DLC's Director of Market Strategy and Development. I've worked in the lighting industry for over 30 years. During that time, I've witnessed multiple lighting technology transformations, such as the transition from fluorescent and high intensity discharge lamps to LEDs, from analog to analog control devices to digital and connected lighting systems, and from static single color light sources to dynamic color tunable light source platforms. We certainly have come a long way. These developments have led to significant reductions in energy use and have also enabled the delivery of spectrally tuned lighting that meets the needs of people, plants, and animals. However, our lead transition has also led to some unintended consequences, especially in the areas of light at night. Our panel is here with us today to discuss these issues. So let's get started. Next slide. But before we start, uh, just a few more reminders. Uh, everyone is automatically muted today. Uh, when and if you should have questions, please use the Zoom chat function to submit the questions during the discussion. We'll do our best. Uh, we're gonna leave 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer those questions at the end of our discussion. Also, the webinar will be made available on the DLC website um, after uh, we're able to re post a recording. Next slide. With that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, we have with us today Jeremy White from the National Park Service, Julia Wong from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and our own senior scientist, Leora Radetsky from the Design Science Consortium. Jeremy White is a physical scientist with the National Park Service Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. He has over 10 years of experience collecting light pollution data in national parks and developing tools and techniques to characterize the nighttime environment. Jeremy is currently working with federal agencies, lighting standards bodies, and lighting manufacturers to help develop sustainable outdoor lighting practices for parks and protected places. He's also assisting with research projects in parks, investigating the impact of outdoor lighting on ecological systems and park visitor perceptions and enjoyment. In addition to light pollution, uh, excuse me, in addition to light pollution research, Jeremy is also an avid astronomer and astrophotographer <coughs> and playing every minute he can get under the stars. <coughs> he holds a degree in wildlife biology from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, and a graduate certificate in data analysis from Colorado State University. Welcome, Jeremy, and thank you for being here. Julia Wang is a project leader at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and her primary focus is on developing and coordinating lights out campaigns with conservation partners and local stakeholders, <clears throat> excuse me, to facilitate widespread public and governmental adoption of conservation practices. These campaigns integrate birdcast research to better target which nights migratory birds are most at risk from the harmful effects of artificial night lighting, as well as to quantify intervention effects. Julia completed her Bachelor of Arts in Government at Cornell University and is particularly interested in the application of research to solving real world problems and in behavioral change on both the individual and systemic level. Julia, we're, we're thrilled that you're with us today. Welcome, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about your work. Leora Radetsky is the DLC's Senior Lighting Scientist, where she provides lighting science input for the DLC's work and is one of the main authors of the DLC's recently launched Luna Technical Requirements. Leora will discuss how non-white light is specified by various regulatory and voluntary organizations and the challenges that are encountered from the lack of standardization and consistency around non-white light sources. Specifically, the challenges around yellow, orange, or amber light sources that are often posed as a solution for environmentally sensitive areas and for astronomical sky glow. In addition to a master's degree in lighting from RPI, Leora holds a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Engineering with an emphasis in illumination from the University of Colorado. 
Leora, it goes unsaid that we're thrilled to not only have you on staff, but have, part, have you as part of our panel today. So thank you all. So with that, I'd like to move, move right to the meat of our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our session. And I'd like to begin by asking our panelists to describe to you, our audience, uh, a little more background and depth on their organizations and why the impact of light are important to their work. So Jeremy, let's start with you. What is the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division? Uh, what's its role within the National Park Service? And what is its purpose with respect to the impacts of light at night? Thanks, Rain. Hello, everyone. So yeah, I work with the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. And our division is part of the Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate of the National Park Service. So the Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate um, serves parks across the country by providing scientific and technical expertise to individual park units for the protection of natural resources. So for our division um, here in Fort Collins, Colorado, we specifically focus on the natural sounds and night skies resources. And we provide tools and scientific expertise to parks um, to understand and characterize the natural sound and night sky resources of the parks and how we can best protect and preserve those. And on the next slide, I'll provide a few examples of um, our role in the Night Skies program and how we serve parks. So in the upper left, uh, you can see a panoramic image. This is from Rocky Mountain National Park here in Colorado. We've developed a calibrated camera that allows us to very precisely measure the background sky brightness um, from parks, so measure the night sky. And we can measure not only the natural sources of light, like the Milky Way, starlight, planets, but we can also measure the anthropogenic sources of light and we can separate the two out so we can um, precisely measure how much uh, artificial or anthropogenic light is coming into the park and how that light may uh, affect the ecosystems of parks but also affect visitor enjoyment uh, and the general environment of the park. So that tool has been used across the country um, in individual park units and also internationally in park units um, around the world. Another role that we place to help and assist parks uh, with outdoor lighting within the park units. So an example is from Big Bend National Park in Texas. So the, uh, the below left image is a um, before and after. Uh, we made some measurements in Big Bend in 2003 and also noticed that the lighting from the park itself was negatively impacting the nighttime environment of the park, reflecting off the bluffs and cliffs of the park. So our division, um, in assistance with Musco lighting, created a lighting design appropriate for Big Bend and appropriate for that environment. And we were able to dramatically reduce the footprint of the outdoor lights in the park. We improved the visibility for park staff and improved the visitor um, enjoyment of the park by um, providing a nice nocturnal scene while still allowing for visibility of the beautiful night sky there in Big Bend. And then a major component of what we do in the division is uh, to share the night, and that is outreach and education, and to provide an understanding of night sky resources, the importance of those resources within the park service, and how night sky ties into cultural and historic, as well as natural resources of the ecosystem of parks, and to um, help National Park Service rangers with um, specific technical training. We have a night sky academy that we um, um, participate in every year, and also provide equipment for um, National Park Service rangers to help share the night sky with the hundreds of millions of visitors who visit the parks across the country. So that's a quick snapshot of uh, what our division does in protecting the night sky uh, of the national parks and beyond. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. That's very interesting. I didn't realize that, that you guys were um, the ones to donate the equipment for all those dark sky events. And uh, that's, re that's really great to hear. So next, let's go to Julia. Uh, Julia, can you share with us what, what is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and what's your mission and why are light at night impacts important to the lab's work? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a project leader at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology being a unit of Cornell um, University that is interested in studying birds as well as other wildlife and producing research, education, and citizen science to better conserve um, our wildlife in general. And so I work specifically as a BirdCast project leader, BirdCast being a research consortium that involves uh, Cornell Lab researchers, as well as researchers from the other universities to better understand bird migration patterns and forecast those and apply them to real world, 
real world problems. And so the reason that Birdcast and Cornell are interested in um, light pollution specifically is in due part because of the major losses that we've seen suffered by birds over the last few decades. Just since 1970, we published research recently in the last few years, we've um, lost about 3 billion birds um, and about 30% of our migratory bird species populations, which is terrible to see, especially in less than a single lifetime. And so light pollution ties into one of the many sources of bird mortalities. And here on the next slide, um, can talk a little bit about collisions. Um, so light pollution is implicated in collisions, which rank somewhere probably behind habitat loss and cat predation in terms of anthropogenic bird mortality. Um, and the reason light pollution is implicated in collisions is because birds navigating um, at night, typically during migration, will usually use um, light signals such as the moon, the stars, etc., in order to get try to go where they're trying to go. And unfortunately, the light pollution from our cities, our houses, our buildings um, draws them in and makes them vulnerable to collisions. Unfortunately, collisions are estimated to kill up to a billion birds in the U.S. each year. And here you can just see a couple of the factors involved in that. Unfortunately, buildings and residences are major sources of both light and uh, bird mortality. Wow, thank you. Um, very, very interesting statistics. Uh, Julia, thank you. Um, Leora, why is the DLC concerned about the negative impacts of light at night and what's the DLC doing about this? Thanks, Doreen. Well, I'm so excited to uh, listen to our panelists and learn today as well. So thanks very much for having me. You know, the, the DLC is very concerned about anthropogenic light at night or artificial light at night. Um, and it's increasing year over year, about 2% per year. And not only is it getting brighter every year, we're also install installing more lighting every year. And so it's increasing in spatial size as well. And LED lighting can contribute to this problem. Um, and so artificial or anthropogenic light at night not only affects um, land-based ecosystems and people, but it also affects freshwater ecosystems and even marine ecosystems. If we keep doing what we're doing, if we don't change the way that we select product and install product and control product, not only are we wasting energy, um, we're wasting money, we're losing our ability to see the night sky, and we're affecting the light dark patterns of hundreds of thousands, even millions of organisms around the world and affecting predator prey relationships as well. Click. Thank you. So, you know, really all of us in the lighting industry have a role to play in minimizing light pollution. Um, we recognize the need to slow down the increase in light pollution. And so we recently introduced a new program called Luna, which has a set of technical requirements that allow you to select outdoor LED lighting that both saves energy and limits light pollution and light trespass. Um, it is currently limited though to warm white LED sources because that's all we have standards for um, in the lighting industry. And we've heard from some stakeholders that they would like us to allow non-white light sources like amber um, sources to be eligible for Luna. And so last year we, we funded a project that looked at the state of the science and the state of the standards um, because we didn't find that information from SDOs at that time, standard development organizations. Um, and I'm happy to see that Tony Esposito is here because we hired him as a contractor for this project. Um, and uh, he did an excellent job helping us understand the problem. And I'm excited to say that we're going through final reviews on our white paper, which will be available publicly and posted on our website soon. So click. So let me just say that any light source that's installed, whether it's white or amber or some other non-white light source is going to play an important role in both astronomical light pollution and in ecological light pollution. Um, we're all connected together. Our success is very much dependent on the entire ecosystem success, right? So for example, let's look at agriculture. Right? Agricultural production is very dependent on pollinator health. It's also very dependent on 
um, plants flowering at a certain time and being available to those pollinators. And we know that light pollution, for example, can change when flowers and fruit happen and that, and it can change how pollinators behave and their reproductive fitness. So it's really important that we look at all of the ecosystems together. You know, we're all very uh, much hearing about zoonotic diseases lately, right? We've all been living in a COVID world. And it turns out that light pollution can also affect um, the transfer of zoonotic diseases and how well animals can resist um, infection. So in the short and the long term, um, we will serve ourselves poorly if we only consider the so-called human-centric aspects of light. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Heather, I think we want to just go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So you all gave excellent introductions to your organizations and, and to your work. Um, and in the context of what we just talked about, we did hear a little bit about some of the trends that are happening. But I'd like to spend a few more minutes going more deeply into the trends uh, that's, that are happening around us in all aspects of our, um, our built and outdoor environments. So with that, um, I guess I'm going to ask Jeremy. Jeremy, would you like to start and uh, share with us your perspectives on, on what you're seeing maybe in, in a little more detail with respect to these trends? Sure. Well, these last um, 10 to 15 years have been incredibly dynamic, not only in how we use light and the change, changes in lighting technology, but also of how we can observe our world and how we can measure our world. So um, increases in, in satellite and um, photographic technology has allowed us to capture almost global um, views of our Earth uh, at night um, on a nightly basis. We've also been able to further develop um, tools here on Earth uh, and in the National Park Service to develop these tools to uh, increase our understanding of um, how light permeates through the environment and how anthropogenic light can impact the natural uh, night and dark cycles. So a couple of things I wanted to highlight that we've seen over the years um, one is that over our measurements of the Park Service that there are some incredibly dark places uh, still left in the United States, thankfully. Um, and these pockets, pockets of, of natural night sky conditions are, are true treasures, um, not only to the Park Service, but to everyone. But we've also seen increases in sky glow and impact the light in our protected places in the United States and in the world. One example of a recently published study by some of my colleagues uh, within the National uh, Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division was in Shalon County, Washington, where they were able to work with that county, Shalon County, to take measurements before and after um, a lighting retrofit in that county. Shalon County was um, aware of the impacts of light at night and wanted to make sure that they're installing uh, correct lights to uh, try to limit or, or mitigate the impacts of light on the environment. Shalon County is adjacent to one of our national park units uh, in Washington. And so we, uh, our colleagues traveled there and were able to take measurements before and after. And interestingly, the, uh, the results were not what we expected. After the retrofit, um, LEDs were installed, replacing high-pressure sodium light. And they were uh, 3,000K LEDs. And the results we found was an increase in sky glow, almost 60% increase in sky glow, even after uh, the retrofit from that old technology. And so what we're seeing is the um, intensity of some of the LEDs, as well as the difference in color spectrum, the um, spectral power distribution of these lights uh, is such that it uh, impacts sky glow or the way that light permeates through the environment and scatters in the sky and can actually increase uh, sky glow and the effect of light at night. We've also used uh, some of our data that we've collected over the years um, to produce, to help produce uh, one of the atlases of light pollution, the New World Atlas of Light Pollution, which looks at not only the upward gradient, so on the right hand side you see the top picture is of just upward gradient, how light um, travels directly up and is co collected by satellites overhead, but to transfer that upward gradient into sky glow, how light actually distributes to the environment and how we see it on the ground. And you can see the difference in these two pictures and the green outlines um, on these maps are national park units. And so upward radiance uh, scatters into the sky and it actually creates sky glow and it can travel for many miles. And from the measurements we've taken from national parks, we've seen sky glow, um, we've measured sky glow as much as 200 kilometers away in some of our national park units and even into pristine wilderness. And so from those trends, we've been working with not only parks, but communities outside of parks to raise awareness to the fact that light can travel for 
many, many miles. And um, the activities of some counties and cities and municipalities can have significant impacts on some of the protected places many miles away. So we're trying to raise that awareness. And in the next slide, um, some trends on the ecology side. Another study um, where um, is in review right now um, with some of uh, my colleagues at Colorado State University is looking at the ecological impact of light at night. And there's been many, many studies recently that have shown that not only do animals respond to very, very low levels of light, natural sources of light, which they have evolved over millions and millions of years with, um, they can detect very low sources of light, but they are also impacted by natural cycles like the moon um, and twilight, and then of course daylight. And what we've seen with increase in the, the use of light and increase in sky glow is that the anthropogenic or artificial source can actually mimic those cycles of moonlight and create as much light as a crescent moon, a quarter moon, and even a full moon. But rather than that being a cyclical process, it's chronic. And so these, the sky glow and this light is actually creating chronic conditions, which mimic the intensity of natural conditions. And so when animals respond normally to natural sources like the moon um, in natural settings, they are then responding to a chronic condition and that is disrupting many, many areas of their life. And so part of the study that we're looking at is the ways in which light can impact, as well as the taxa or the different species that it can impact. And what we found that it has impacts across a range of taxa, a range of wildlife from insects to um, large predators and carnivores, um, and also in um, the natural history or the um, natural patterns of uh, activity. So that can be movement, foraging, mating, um, migration, and even physiological processes uh, individually. And so we're gathering a wealth of information about how animals respond to natural and artificial sources of light. And we're also uh, recognizing and, and monitoring how light is kind of uh, permeating through the environment into our protected places. And we'll talk about later is how we can connect that information together um, and to create uh, you know, uh, situations in which light uh, is useful to humans and has uh, minimal negative effects on the environment. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. I certainly hope that we can, can get to that end point soon, soon indeed. So next, let's uh, give Julia an opportunity to share with the, the group what she's seeing from her perspective and uh, your work with uh, Cornell. Absolutely. So I wanted to talk a little more specifically about um, birds in among the other many species affected by light pollution. So about 70% of birds in North America are migratory species and about 80% of them migrate at night for various reasons, including um, it's easier to escape predation, et cetera. And um, with light pollution sort of pulling them off their migratory courses, what you see is examples like this. This is the 9-11 Memorial Tribute in light, goes up every year on 9-11, um, very bright seen on light bulbs. Um, what you're seeing swirling in those beams of light, in fact, is not insects, is not snow, but it's hundreds and hundreds of birds. Um, and a lot of these birds swirl until they're absolutely exhausted, leaving them vulnerable to collisions, predation, other urban threats. And so um, the next slide, if we will is a couple of examples of major collisions that have happened due to this increasing light pollution. And so over here, furthest on the left, um, there was a major collision just last fall in New York City, which killed hundreds of birds. You're seeing a collision monitoring walking around downtown buildings, picking up bird after bird, all killed in a single collision at night. Um, over there in the middle is a news article from 2020, a very similar thing happened in Philadelphia. Um, estimated, I believe, 1,000 to 1,500 birds were killed in a single night during migration uh, in collisions with tall buildings. Over there on the right is a single uh, lit tall building with floodlights um, on the coast of Texas in Galveston. And that night, 400 migratory birds uh, pictured below were killed at that single building. Um, and so we're very concerned about these collisions. These are just a few among many, um, a few that made major news. But as I mentioned before, up to a billion birds are being killed in collisions a year. Like these birds can't see glass in the way that people do, especially when there's lit glass at night and lights pull them in towards urban settings where they're more likely to collide with lit glass buildings, unfortunately. Oh, uh, sorry, next slide. 
but this is uh, heading on to, to Leora, but um, I just want to just take a second and uh, say, um, yes, yeah, someone commented that that is so sad and sharing with the group every time I um, see these videos with Julia, I have to get out my tissues because it makes me personally very emotional, especially when we just learned from you a few minutes ago that we've lost 30% of our bird population. And yeah. it's so clear from, from that last slide it, it's it's very, very clear about what some of the major causes of this are. So I, I hope that um, as we further engage in the conversation, and as we all move on, that yeah. we can all begin to think more deeply about this. Um, um, before, sorry, before we head on, I just got a quick question that we get a lot. So I'll just answer it very briefly about why birds are colliding with illuminated buildings. And isn't that counterintuitive and it is um, but a lot of these buildings aren't made from bird friendly glass and birds can't see them in the way that um, they see other things in the way that we see buildings and so it's it's partially an issue of the lit window bays themselves and the external lighting of the buildings but it's overall an issue of birds being brought into an area where they're more likely to collide with buildings in general because mm -hmm. of the light pollution from urban areas um, once they're in that vulnerable position being pulled into these cities um, then they do have a tendency to collide with uh, lit windows because again they don't they don't perceive that there's a glass barrier there Okay, thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, Lior, let's move on to you. Um, what are you seeing in the world of, of trends and whatnot? Yeah, thank you. Um, so one of the trends that, that we are seeing um, in the lighting industry is a lot of interest in the development of an installation of spectrally tuned LED light sources. You know, especially those that mitigate light pollution, whether it's astronomical or ecological. And Clearly, those are, are of interest because, you know, we don't want to go back to, to no light at night necessarily. We'd like to have light that still benefits people um, and also minimizes its uh, potential negative impact in the environment. And the research is fairly clear, at least for astronomical light pollution, that short wavelength light or blue light is a factor in, uh, in light pollution. There is a spectral effect. And in many cases, in ecological light pollution. The problem is, is that there isn't a consensus on what is blue, let alone a standard way of defining blue light. So here, if you look at the voluntary programs or codes around astronomical light pollution here on the left, you can see that almost all of them want to limit blue light in some way, right? But the range of wavelengths indicated by those arrows um, is slightly different from organization to organization, and the absolute amounts of blue light that you see there also varies as well. Um, so here's four organizations. Um, there are others, but here you see the Smart Outdoor Lighting Alliance, their community-friendly lighting program, um, IDA's uh, Fixture Seal of Approval program and their innovation category, um, the Low Impact Lighting Standard from the members of the European Environmental Bureau, and the Hawaii County Code. And each of these organizations has different stakeholders, uh, potentially, and certainly different contributors and experts, um, and even different objectives. And so it's not surprising that we see these differences between them, um, but it can be difficult to understand how to develop products and, and how to you know, optimize products when the standards are so different. And so there is a lot of interest happily from standards development organizations like CIE and IES um, in working towards developing consensus standardized measurements and metrics um, for astronomical light pollution. In terms of ecological light pollution, you know, I, I want to start by saying there is no single wildlife friendly spectrum or amount of light or timing of light um, or duration of light. Um, not only does the taxa matter, um, but the dose and timing matter and the spectrum matters as well. So if you could just click Heather. Thank you. So here um, we see that, for example, for sea turtle lighting um, programs, um, that they're really interested in disallowing any blue or green light whatsoever. So, um, you know, you typically don't see any light allowed below about 560 nanometers, which means that phosphor converted amber is not a suitable choice for this application. But we do still see some differences in the absolute wavelength cutoff value between these two programs. Uh, this is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission's program 
and IDA's uh, fixture seal of appro approval, their sea turtle specific spectrum. Um, it isn't clear why they are actually different. So, you know, I think that Jeremy uh, mentioned this. I think it's important to say it one more time. You know, any of these standards or programs around um, ecology need to be very specific with regards to taxa. You know, it doesn't affect all uh, animals the same way. Many animals have behaviors that are disrupted by meaningfully dose, meaningful doses of, of polychromatic white light or blue light at night, but not all of them. You know, fireflies, for example, especially female fireflies, flash differently um, under amber light compared to other light sources. And so an amber light source is not going to be the best solution every single time. Next slide, please. So let's talk about um, a little bit about naming conventions. So speaking of light colors and light names, one of the most common ways that we characterize light is by its chromaticity or its correlated color temperature. And for white light sources, you know, we're very lucky to have standards for LED light sources and others that tell us exactly how uh, luminaires or a light, an LED sources chromaticity or CCT is defined. So it's very clear what you're going to get if you're following uh, requirements or regulations that use these standards. So, um, but there aren't any standards for uh, non-white light. So if you could just click, please. So here you see um, a word cloud from, uh, taken from specification sheets from amber LED products listed with either IDA or the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. And you'll notice here that the word amber shows up a bunch, but not always. And it's not always easy to tell if, if a light source is a phosphor converted light source or a narrow band light source. You rarely ever see a spectral power distribution. Sometimes you see CCT terminology, other times you see peak wavelength, but not always. This is an application that is begging for the lighting industry to step in and develop standards for, so we can define what we mean for each of these. If you just click one more time, and we see this happening in the literature too. This is a research paper that actually shows an SPD uh, in an experiment um, and they use the word amber. But if you look carefully at the peak, it's uh, longer than the typical peak wavelength of amber. And so this might not actually be an amber product. It might be an orange product. Researchers and other disciplines use our terminology. And so it helps us all if we can standardize how we label these products so we can speak to each other clearly. That is it for me. Thank you, Leora. Very interesting. Love your word cloud and the introduction of it. Uh, Heather, may we please go to the next slide? Okay, so that was all really great information. So now let's, let's take our last um, 10 minutes here and let's talk about solutions. I'd like to hear more from the group, um, from your perspective, what more can be done to help overcome um, barriers overcome these issues that, that you're all experiencing from your various um, perspectives and the work that you do within our industry and, and your industries as well. Um, I think we're going to start again with Jeremy. Jeremy, would you like to share with the group what you see as maybe some opportunities for, for solutions? Sure. There's a lot here that we could talk about. Um, Leora really spoke to the importance of um, standards and uh, getting on the same page with um, specification, terminology, all sorts of different aspects of lighting and make sure we're all speaking the same language and um, can share that language with others, even uh, non-lighting folks, um, because lighting kind of is integrated across all uh, aspects of, of our life. And it's not just lighting designers and engineers who are working with lights. Um, that could have been something we spoke about with trends is that more and more people are becoming involved with lighting, especially as uh, lighting becomes more dynamic. Uh, I feel like there's an increase in, in understanding and an interest in becoming involved in lighting in communities. Um, we've seen that in the park surface as well. So I uh, shared terminology and understanding of, you know, getting on the same page of what we're talking about is important. Um, one one uh, possible solution or, or solution that we're working on in the park service and working with um, researchers across universities is uh, on that same vein, and that's connecting um, ecologists visual ecologists and biologists, wildlife biologists, with the lighting industry, with lighting manufacturers, with engineers and designers, folks who design um, and develop standards, um, to connect the information that is coming out at such a rapid pace um, on these different fields. I feel like a lot of these fields are very siloed, 
even with ecology, um, different types of ecology and ecological research is even siloed within it, its own, you know, uh, its own little area. And oftentimes researchers don't um, speak with one another, even though there's the reason we have journals and we can read the journals, there's just so much information. Um, it would be great to have cross cutting um, and interdisciplinary teams working together. And that's what we're seeing now. And that's what um, the folks on this call um, have been involved in these inter interdisciplinary teams. And so in terms of solutions, it's, it's sharing what we know um, in these different fields. One case study I want to uh, point out in the Park Service is that uh, Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming um, at Coulter Bay, the main kind of one of the uh, highest density use areas in that park. Um, we partnered with Boise State University um, and have installed some fairly novel clear field red lights. They're not quite monochromatic. There's one little LED, white LED element in an otherwise monochromatic red light. And we replaced the old parking lot lights of Coulter Bay um, with these red lights uh, with two banks. So there's an ability to go all uh, broadband, 3000 K white or this kind of clear field red. Um, the reason we did this was uh, twofold. One is to um, tap into the latest research in ecology on insect, insect and bat attraction to lights. And some of the uh, research coming out of the Netherlands and others showing that there's a decrease in attraction when uh, there's very little or no blue content and getting into that uh, red portion of the spectrum, as you can see in the image below. And also at Grand Teton specifically, there was an increase, an observed increase in insect activity around Coulter Bay. And therefore that brought in bats. And then there was um, problems and issues with bat and human interaction. And so uh, this was an opportunity to test the latest research, use some of the newest technology um, to see if we could uh, find a solution there. And um, this study is still ongoing, but some of the preliminary data does show based on the biological sampling that Boise State has done, as well as some of the social science work that one, the use of the clear field red lights has decreased insect and bat activity around Coulter Bay. And so the attraction uh, is not there anymore. And second is that the visitors from Coulter Bay who have been surveyed while these lights are on um, are very supportive uh, of these lights and actually find it um, to be not only novel, but actually their ability to see the night sky because of the red light uh, is increased. And so you can actually see the Milky Way standing in the middle of um, Coulter Bay parking lot. So that's just one example of what I just spoke to is the connecting the ecological research with the um, lighting technology. And, and bringing those together. And it works well in a protected area like a national park uh, where this may be appropriate. We recognize that this is not a solution for all places. Red light is uh, maybe not the best um, for, for certain applications, although this was an opportunity that we found uh, that seemed to work. We um, continue to work with parks uh, just to uh, bring an understanding to what lighting can do to the environment and what lighting actually um, is appropriate and, and um, good for, for protective places for sure. So in the example on the right from Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona, um, Grand Canyon uh, is seeking international dark sky and actually has uh, received international dark sky um, certification and retrofitted a number of lights. And from the El Tavar Hotel right there on the south rim, they retrofitted some of those um, older lights to newer LED technology with shielding uh, and with uh, reduced light intensities. Um, and that actually improves the visual quality and the visual scene of the El Pavar right there, but also has uh, further enhanced the visitor enjoyment of seeing the night sky um, right there from El Pavar. We're uh, working with parks across the United States um, to do this very thing and to recognize what lighting is necessary um, and what intensities are necessary and, and provide proper lighting design. So again, I'll just reiterate the, the um, interdisciplinary interdisciplinary approach to lighting and bringing together folks from all different disciplines um, for specific tasks and for tip specific case studies, but also for municipalities and, and others. One other approach I'll mention quickly is just the idea of a, um, a larger landscape footprint of lighting. And so take a step back and look at lighting as a almost like a watershed. The way we look at watersheds is to look at light sheds. And again, how light travels through the environment on a landscape scale using that satellite imagery and some of that um, large imagery that we have, but working with communities, with um, with chambers of commerce, and uh, working with multiple cities and areas with um, dark skies in between um, to develop these kind of dark sky sanctuaries. An example is the dark sky a plateau or Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative, where a number of different uh, groups have come together to uh, protect the night sky on a large landscape scale. Uh, and that's another approach that is, is working well and I think it's gonna be fundamental moving forward.
to protect night sky resources, but also improve you know the lighting quality and um, of our communities. That's that's excellent. Thank you, Jeremy, for, for sharing all that. That's all so interesting. We could go on for another hour, I think, about about those topics, but we don't have that time. So with that, we'll turn to Julia and uh, have her take some time and share with us her perspective on on solutions and activities that are that are happening to help with these issues. Perfect. I'll try to move through this pretty quickly, but essentially what we're interested in is what we call lights out campaigns to protect migrating birds. Um, so we found us that turning off lights or reducing non-essential lighting as much as possible during migration season, um, during the night, typically from 11 to 6 or as long as you can get it, really helps protect these birds. And so what you're seeing here is um, a population density scan of the previous tribute in light um, area that I showed a video of before with all the birds swirling in the xenon lights. And so what you can see here is how drastically the population density changes when lights are on. On, um, on the right versus off on the left. And so what we do now is we work in concert with the Tribute and Light to monitor this event and turn off lights every 20 to 30 minutes so birds are given the chance to disperse. Um, and so we've reduced collisions or deaths greatly because of that. If we can move to the next slide. So here's another example of uh, how the Lights Out intervention works and the fact that it does work. This is the McCormick Place Convention Center in Chicago, which is the U.S.'s largest convention center, I believe. And unfortunately, it is also a notorious bird killer. Um, since 1978, we've been monitoring uh, bird collisions there, and there have been over 40,000 dead birds found in just that time. Um, part of that is due to all of the glass in the building. Part of it is due to its location um, on near one of the Great Lakes with a lot of bird migration passing through. Um, and part of that is due to the light of the building. And so what we found in looking at over two decades of research here um, is that when lights were dimmed to their lowest historical levels, the collisions were reduced by about 60% at this building. And we also found that both internal and external lighting, unfortunately, did uh, increase collision. So both are important to reduce, manage, mitigate in order to protect our wildlife. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So here I want to talk a little bit about dynamic conservation and what my uh, uh, what BirdCast specifically does. Um, and so BirdCast, uh, we look at radar um, in order to forecast when and where birds are moving. Over here on the left, you see a radar scan of both precipitation and biology. Um, so with machine learning and a bunch of other stuff, we've managed to separate out the biological aspects of that radar da data and thereby create models and tools where you can predict when and where birds are moving. Um, if you can move to the next slide. On our website, birdcast.info, you can utilize some of these migration tools over here on the left. You can see a live bird migration forecast. It runs during migration in the spring and the fall, and you can follow where birds are moving throughout the continental US. We also have birdcast forecasts where you can see where birds are predicted to move in the next three nights. Over here on the right, you see one of our most recent tools, which we call our Lights Out Alerts. Um, here you can search your area, your city, or your state um, in order to find out what the forecast may be and how that may affect whether you should be turning on or off your lights um, at any given moment. And so we try to communicate that information and into interdisciplinary work, sorry, with uh, city governments, conservation organizations, uh, building owners and managers, business owners, um, in order to get as much light reduced during migration season as possible in urban areas. And what we also do is we look at where light pollution and bird migration intersect the most in order to prioritize um, areas of most concern. So um, I believe Chicago was the city with the highest light pollution in respect to bird migration migration um, and Dallas and then sorry Houston and then Dallas were number two and three after that in a study that we published a few years ago and so what we're what we've been working on since 2020 is targeting um, Texas cities for turning off lights as a bit of a case study uh, to enact lights out campaigns we can talk about that a little on the next slide so here you see some of the work that we've done over the course of the last two years um, 
we've worked with cities, sustainability offices, mayor's offices, um, building owners and managers associations, local conservation and Audubon groups in order to spread the word and ask people to turn off non-essential lighting between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. during migration season, especially during periods that we project to have the highest migration that we call peak periods during each season. And so what you see here is a uh, Dallas, Texas last spring um, during their lights out nights, uh, the mayor proclaimed a period of a several weeks that aligned with when we were forecasting the highest migration um, to ask that all sort of city building business owners turn off their lights so much as possible. Um, and so we were able to uh, gather, I believe, seven city proclamations and one county proclamation this last year in Texas, which we're very excited to see. But of course, there's more work to do. Um, and next slide. So these are our lights out guidelines. You don't have to read all of that right now, but like the general the general idea is to keep lights off, long, low, or shielded as much as possible during migration season. And we provide these guidelines and more information about the effort on the BirdCast website, which will be linked, I believe, on a slide at the end of this. Wow, that's that's incredible. The 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 contrast in uh, the city with the the before and the after is remarkable. Thank you for sharing that with with us and for your audience um, and with the audience. Nope, please stay on the last slide. Um, Heather, you can go back up one, please. Thank you. So with that, um, kind of a, a final question to the group, and I think. Um, and the question is, um, as Jeremy mentioned this earlier, that the impacts of light at night, they cut across multiple scientific disciplines, lighting science, physical science, environmental science, the social sciences as well, as, as well as architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, just anyone and everyone that's involved with studying the earth and building and designing buildings and habitats is impacted and need, needs to know more about about these impacts. So my question to the panel is, how do we address and connect all these disparate groups and, and help to better inform everybody about not only the problems and the issues, but as well as possible ways and solutions they might be addressed. With that, I'm gonna go to Leora and ask Leora for, for you to, to weigh in on that initially. Sure, thank you. You know, I think that certainly from a, a funding and research perspective, you know, there, there's always funding mechanisms that allow, uh, that really um, support multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary educational and research efforts, you know, to try to get people from different backgrounds together. And, and I think those uh, certainly are a part of it. I, I'm really happy to see, for example, that um, the Illumination Engineering Society, the IES, has a new committee called the One Committee or the Outdoor Nighttime Environments Committee that is really working on some of these issues. And they have really um, prioritized having stakeholders from, uh, you know, different with different expertise. So Jeremy sits on that committee, I'm on that committee. They have other um, ecologists and biologists. And, and I'll agree, you know, with both Jeremy and Julia, you know, uh, we all are siloed. I'm, I'm a lighting I'm trained in the lighting sciences, right? In lighting engineering. I'm not an ecologist or a biologist. I can never claim to be an expert here. So it's really important that we, we bring in dom, you know, topic experts and domain experts, and we make sure that we're not asking one ecologist to speak for all of these different uh, types of ecosystems. That's really important too. Thank That's you. That's the way we're gonna solve it. Good, uh, Julia do, uh, or Jeremy, do either of you want to, to weigh in on, on this discussion again? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so you may have gathered from the way that I was talking about it, but the way that our work works in order to get these lights off or lights changed or retrofitted is speaking to as diverse a group of stakeholders as we can. And so a lot of it is education and outreach and working with, you know, anyone who will give you the time of the day, but um, especially people in the lighting industry and building management and city government in order to start local change that can hopefully spiral from there. Agreed. Jeremy, is there anything you'd like to add? Sure, I'll echo uh, what Leora said um, with the Illuminating Engineering Society. Some of the um, standards that we're starting to see um, not only provide uh, a, a minimum light level, you know, some of the past standards provided just minimum levels where lighting designers and engineers 
use those minimum levels and usually went above those levels to make sure that they're providing appropriate light. We're starting to see some more nuanced lighting standards come out with um, minimum and maximums. And we're going beyond just horizontal illuminance and vertical illuminance for some of the specifications in these standards. Um, we're starting to see things like dimming uh, schedules and dimming levels. Um, we're looking at going beyond just the photometric illuminance, but looking at maybe radiometric units, things like that. Um, giving lighting designers and engineers uh, more tools in the toolbox to provide appropriate and nuanced uh, lighting design for municipalities, for residences. Um, and as Leora said, the, with the IES-1 committee, one thing that we're, we're starting to work on is, is uh, lighting for parks and protected places and lighting in, in places that otherwise are darker than the normal built environment. Uh, it's critical for the National Park Service for sure, but also um, will benefit, I think, um, any uh, rural or uh, protected areas uh, across the country. And again, this recognizes the ambient background condition, recognizes the, the, dark, the night sky resource um, in the ambient level in these darker places and will tailor lighting specifications to those conditions um, that it will benefit wildlife and also benefit people in those environments as well. So um, I think we're starting to see a range of tools and if we can continue that trend as well uh, um, in this cross-cutting approach, um, it will allow for, I think, a, a better lighting design overall and allow us to better take advantage of some of the new technology that's coming out. Um, with solid state lighting, it's uh, really some of the work from the Department of Energy and um, labs like Pacific uh, National Northwest, La uh, Northwest National Labs. Um, what we hear from them and from, the, from a lot of the lighting researchers is that almost anything is possible with um, spectral tuning, uh, with dimming, some of the integrated controls. It's that wholesale or the uh, holistic approach to lighting. It's not just one metric or the other. It's using all the tools available. Some of this new technology is really gonna get us to um, where we'd like to go. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the clock and uh, I think we're just a few minutes over. So Heather, if you could just go to the next slide. It's that time, time for questions. My, my colleague, Liesl, has been uh, trying to track the questions and she's gonna join us and she's gonna help try to distribute those uh, accordingly. Uh, but Liesl, before you hop in here, I'm just gonna ask uh, Julia a quick question uh, with respect to BirdCast. The map you showed was of the United States. Do, yes. does, your, does your program also look at the migration path up into Canada as well, or are you just so US focused? So that's just an issue of, uh, no, unfortunately, we don't have access to that data at the moment, but it is something we are interested in obtaining and working on at the moment. Right now, we just share projections and forecasting for the continental U.S. Thank you. Uh, Lethal, are you uh, with us? Would you like to, to step in and go to questions? The, uh, the combination of your questions and the panelists um, answered a number of the questions that were coming in, but I will tee up a couple of them that came in that I thought um, they can still add some additional information. Thank you. Um, so there was a question that said, cutoff is important, but standards such as levels and uniformity become an issue as LED is more concentric beam and reflected light is a major component of light pollution. Is surface reflectance being looked at in updated outdoor design standards? So I think that's Leora probably, if you could take a hit at that. Is surface reflectance being looked at in updated outdoor design standards to combat this? You know, the, there are some new standards that are coming out. I, I think they are still illuminance based, but in um, the IES, for example, has a number of um, lighting practice standards and others, and there's a link to the lighting library that really talk about how to, what the hierarchy is for outdoor lighting and how to create assurance um, as well as other um, important factors of the environment. So I would certainly look there. You know, the other thing that I think there's some development in, but, but hopefully more standardization and use of, is of light pollution uh, predicting software. You know, the, the lighting software programs that we use now don't have any sort of scattering, you know, of light in the sky or extinction parameters. And so we just pretend we're in a black hole. But if we can combine some of the light pollution software and our application software, which does consider luminances, we can start to make better predictions about what's happening you know, at any, at any level sort of in the atmosphere. So that's a very exciting improvement that I hope to see. And I hope we see connected lighting take advantage of information from BirdCast, for example, right? So that we know exactly how to automate uh, dimming or turning lights off too. That's helpful. 
Um, I guess, Lisa, I'm going to jump in. Jeremy, is there anything from your perspective you want to add regarding the, the surface reflectance? Uh, certainly, yeah, that's certainly an important consideration. Um, you know, just looking through IES standards, I, I know the roadway standards, RP8, looks at um, albedo or surface reflectance of um, different types of roadway materials. Um, and rather than use illuminance, which is um, does not take into account any sort of reflectivity, um, they, the RP8 includes luminance levels and scaled luminance levels based on the reflectivity of the, the materials being used for the different roadways. So that's one example. But I, I agree that that should be considered beyond just roadway lighting, but into um, other types of, of lighting as well, because reflectivity um, can have a huge impact. One study I recently read was the impact on snow um, and the you know, high albedo of snow, of course, and the over a thousand percent increase it can have on um, night sky brightness uh, in in the built environment. And we've I've, we've um, measured that here in Fort Collins as well. When there's cloud cover plus snow, um, we see many hundred percent increase in overall brightness of the sky because of just that combined double reflectivity. So um, it can't just be the luminous output uh, on the ground, but that's considered, but rather the 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 whole path of that light um, back to the environment. Um, Leora spoke to the, the need for light pollution software and understanding, and that's a complex topic, but I think it's going to be really important. And I think is, is continuing to develop as we can model um, the impact of light in its entire path uh, on the environment. Thank you. Liesl, any additional questions that have come to um, wait, There's quite a few. I don't think we're going to get to all of them, but there's a few that I thought, there's two different ones that I think that we can, uh, we can cover. Um, I think this one was geared toward Leora. This was during the time that you were talking and uh, the person said that they love the idea of people sharing information and resources, but what venues exist for these connections to be made? And you mentioned the one committee with IES. Can you think of other places where they can share information, especially on, I think this was specifically while you were talking about the standards regarding um, and, and consistency in standards. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that um, I have learned to do as a researcher is, is when I'm trying to learn about something new is, is to attend conferences, you know, where that aren't lighting conferences to sort of step outside of my bubble, you know, and learn more. So I think that, you know, each organization um, has their own regional or national conferences. Um, and I think it's important to learn what other people are saying and to be willing to, to connect and, and maybe try some pilots, you know, or mock-ups where you're, you're working together to make a difference, you know, certainly there are um, cities and um, localities um, that exist in the U.S. And, and elsewhere that are really trying to, to integrate um, these ideas together. And so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we'll see more, um, you know, more multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary groups working together. I think that that's a trend. And certainly um, the fact that we're all connected online so much more easily now, I think, makes it happen even more so. Got it. Okay, and then there was one more question that was sort of, there's two questions that were related, so I'm going to throw them out there because I think this it's a little different um, from what we're talking about here, but I, it's interesting and I'm wondering if anybody has information they can apply here. Um, they asked, could you talk a little bit about impacts of artificial lighting on bioluminescent phase? Um, and there was a separate question that said, understanding this is geared more toward bird issues, but are there similar solutions being implemented or at least guidelines for Great Lakes or coastal applications for large marinas? and uh, hotels or resorts. This is more about marine sort of applications. I'll just jump in quickly on the bioluminescent bays. I, I don't know too much specifically about that, although I do know that the, the natural light um, stemming from those bioluminescence is incredibly dim and incredibly beautiful. Um, and so it wouldn't take much anthropogenic or artificial light to overwhelm that natural source of light and reduce the contrast between the bay and the, the sky, background sky brightness. Um, that's very similar to when we talk about fireflies as well. The bioluminescence from fireflies is a very dim output and so it wouldn't take much to overwhelm or swamp that natural source. Uh, so in those highly sensitive areas or for species that use bioluminescence or use very dim levels of light, uh, that is a critical time to really control um, when and, and where and how light is used. Um, I don't, I can't speak to specific research to that, although I just know that um, those are, are very, very sensitive resources with very dim levels of light. Uh, and that is when uh, lighting needs to be used only, only if necessary and um, uh, be analyzed critically. 
Okay, thank you. I, I see by the clock that we are at times so we are going to have to wrap. Uh, Heather, if you don't mind going to our last, I think it's our last slide. Um, there are a couple things here. One is we did just scratch the surface here. And so there are some resource links here that you can take advantage of uh, if you're looking to go deeper in any of this information, as well as next slide, Heather. Um, also, if you're interested in staying uh, on top of what we're doing here at the Design Lights Consortium, together with our partners, please go to our website and subscribe for updates um, from the DLC. That way you'll be in the loop as we evolve this topic and continue to have additional webinars in our Responsible Light at Night series. So with that, I do want to thank you all. I know some of you are here a minute or two too late. Oh, one more thing. I did notice a few questions in the chat, Jeremy, about some of the technology solutions in your projects. So we'll come back and share those with, with you and perhaps you could then reply to those questions via email and things like that. That's fantastic. Yeah, there's a great conversation going on in the chat. So it'd be good to revisit that. Yeah, okay, thanks. And, and everybody, panelists, thank you very much for all of your wonderful contributions. Very enlightening, very interesting, on some levels a bit sad on a few places, but hopefully everyone on the call here today um, can begin to take action and, uh, and help. And uh, it, it'll take time, but I'm confident we can all band together and, and get there. So thanks again, panelists. Thank you, attendees. And we hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thank you.